uh, and the affirmation of these Judaizers would maybe even lead to some version of persecution. And so the only way they would be able to overcome that was, as Paul says, to live by faith. That's the only way we can overcome these fears is to live by faith. But this wasn't just about faith in general, like, okay, you just got to trust God. Paul tells Peter they need to have faith in the realities of the gospel. That's why he says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's referring to the truths of the gospel. And this is why the verse is kind of structured the way that it is, right? The first half is the gospel. The second half is an encouragement to live by faith in the truths of that gospel. So first he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That, that, that's a description of what the gospel does. That's the beauty of our new life in Christ. And understand that is our reality, whether or not we believe it. The gospel is our world. So to fully experience all the blessings of that, we need to have faith in that reality. And that's why he says in the second half of the verse, in the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So right away, we see the gospel for everyday life. Paul doesn't say, I've been crucified with Christ, so now I'm forgiven. I've been crucified with Christ, so now I get to go to heaven. He says, I've been crucified with Christ, so the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. So do you kind of see the bigger picture? If we're going to overcome our fear of man, we need to live by faith in the realities of the gospel. And our passage gives us two particular focuses, our justification and Christ's love, right? And so let's dive into those two, two in particular. So two ideas. First, A, we live by faith that Christ justifies us. We are who God declares us to be. Now we'll spend more more. More time on this idea. We'll come back to that second point, love, next week. We'll touch on it some today, but if you get a little nervous when we get through this, we're like, wow, this is, this is going long. Um, we're going to spend most of our time here. But let me ask you, what is your justification? By that I mean, what would make your life right? What, what, what would say that you're good in some way? I know for me, and I've had this for most of my life, one of my struggles is believing that success in some way defines me. Right? Like sometimes if I don't feel like a sermon goes so well, I don't feel great about myself because I'm, again, driven a bit by success. And by the way, having a third service doesn't help this. Because before, I feel like it's almost kind of like God mocking me. Before I preached a message and I would just kind of power through the second one and I, didn't, I knew it didn't go so well. But with the third service, I preached the first two. And then it's like God saying, you know, I'm going to have you wait a few hours. And then you come back and then I'll preach that bad sermon one more time just to remind you how bad it was. So I'll text my wife sometimes. I'll say, oh, man, this, this did not go so well. I did that recently. And the best part of, of saying this is some of you are thinking, no, I remember that message. Yeah, that wasn't good. And the, the worst part is a lot of you are thinking of different messages. But it's easy for me to find my justification in some version of success. And so what about you? Where do you find your justification? Now, we start here with justification because this is really the larger focus of the passage. When we say we need to live by faith uh, that Christ died for us, He's leaning into the gospel that he's really been expounding upon for verse after verse. And specifically, Paul has been talking about our justification. Uh, verse 16 of chapter 2, he says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, so that we also have believed in, G in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Okay, so what is justification? It's the idea of God declaring that we are righteous. So, don't, so understand this. Remember that the gospel says that we're all sinners. And because our sin is rebellion against the holy and righteous one who created us, we're facing just judgment. So in our sin, we are unholy and we are unrighteous. And, and, and we're in this broken relationship with our holy and our righteous God. And there's nothing we can do about this, right? No matter of obedience like carrying out the Old Testament law can fix this. Our sin condemns us. It declares that we are sinners and should be judged. But the gospel tells us that all is not lost, right? Uh, because of the hope we have in Christ. He came to live the life that we weren't able to. And then he went to the cross to suffer the punishment that we deserve on our behalf, right? So, so Jesus was credited with our sin and, and punished for it while we were credited with Christ's righteousness and accepted as sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. And this is why Paul says that he, what he does in our text. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. James Boyce writes this. He says, this means to be so united to Christ that all the experiences of Christ becoming, 
become the Christian's experiences. Thus, his death for sin was the believer's death. His resurrection was, in one sense, the believer's resurrection. So justification then, in particular, has to do with God's declaration that a person is righteous through belief and trust in the work of, of Christ. So it's not that we are righteous on our own, but God is willing to declare us righteous through the work of Jesus. Okay, so how does this tie into our fear of man and the idolatry of people? It's this, if, if we don't find our justification in the gospel, we're going to seek it elsewhere. Specifically, we will turn to our idols to give us what we need to be right. In other words, if, you don't feel, if, if I don't feel I'm right with God, based on the work of Christ, I'm simply going to seek to be right in some other way. And often we seek that from people. We want them to declare that we are right. That's why we want approval and pleasure and success and admiration and love. Why we believe people have this ability. We, we might say they get to declare it. And that's why people's opinions matter so much to us. Again, if I don't rest in who God declares me to be, I will seek for someone in this world to declare me to be right and good. And so we give people the right to declare who we are. Right? Don't we love when they say, through word or deed, you're special. You're right. You're beautiful. You're my friend. You have such potential. I want to be with you. And conversely, we hate when they declare in some way, you're, we're not right. You're a failure. You're wrong. You're unattractive. You're not my friend. You're hopeless. I don't want to be with you. And importantly, it's not just words, but it's deeds. For example, if I text you and you never text me back, that might say something about our relationship. Or imagine without a word said that there is a difference if I, if I forget my wife's birthday versus if I buy her a very thoughtful gift. And you can imagine, see, she's my actions as declaring, is she worthy or lo of love or not? And the difficulty in all this becomes um, my interpretation because the weight I give to people's declarations because right? the reality is someone's declaration can have some, if not a lot of truth, or it can be completely false. Right? Someone can say something about me. Is it true? Is it false? If someone says, I don't want to be your friend, or you're a bad golfer, or you're wrong, these could be very true statements. On their hand, someone might say, I, I want to be your friend, or you don't love me, or you're such a loser, and those can be completely false statements. In other words, people's declarations can be true or false, and it becomes more muddled because regardless of the veracity of the declarations, I'm interpreting them and I'm giving weight to them. So if a friend says, I'm too busy to hang out, I can interpret that a lot of ways. So maybe they, they really are too busy, but I think they don't want to be my friend. So again, it gets convoluted in that I'm, I'm trying to figure out what people are saying about me. So for example, someone doesn't answer my text. My spouse makes a weight comment. I don't get invited to an event. I miss out on that promotion. No one thanks me after serving in ministry. A friend makes a joke about my kid. I'm interpreting what those mean and what they say about me. And again, with these interpretations, I give weight to them. I, I might not care or I might really care about, about what someone says. Um, so what someone says about us has to do with the weight that I give to it. When I was young, for instance, you didn't want to be a nerd, right? That, that was like a, you don't you want to, but now there's such a thing, right? It's nerd culture. People seem to really lean into that. In fact, I, there was a conference recently that I saw. It was called Nerd Culture Ministry Summit. And I thought that's so good. Like, I really wanted to go to you. I just want to know um, the, the tagline was building bridges between church culture and nerd culture by equipping ministry leaders to better love their nerdy neighbors. So I was like, oh man, I've... I didn't get to go. I think it wasn't, it wasn't close to us. But the, the first keynote, it says, State of the Union, welcome to the quantum realm. So I was like, oh, man. Uh, another keynote was nerd ministry in your church, tangible steps, steps you can take. So um, I wanted to be there for that. Um, for some of you, you don't want to be a nerd. Some of you, you fully embrace it. The question is, do you give weight to that? Right? If you call me a bad golfer, I don't, really, I don't really care. I would totally agree with you. I'm not offended. Uh, I'll proceed to make fun of myself. But if you said something like, I don't want to be your friend, you can imagine that's going to hurt. I'm going to really start to think through that. Not just what that means about us, but the conclusion of what does that say about me? Like, why am I so wrong uh, that you're, I'm no longer worthy of your friendship? But all this, in a, in, in a, it's me in a sense that gives people the power to declare if I'm right or not. To let them justify or condemn me. And this is where the fear of man comes in. We want to be justified. We want some version of righteousness. We make an idol of people, and so we want our idols to declare that we're okay. 
And conversely, we hate when they declare otherwise. So this is where the gospel can change everything. Because the gospel says, I am justified by grace and through faith in the work of Christ. That in this, God declares me to be righteous. And this means I don't need to keep seeking to be right based on what other people give or offer. What they declare about me. Rather, when I face, when I rest in the fact that Christ died for me, my heart can rest. And this is why Paul says what he does. He says, the life I now live... Right? It could be translated, now am living. So this isn't talking about simply about, about when he got saved, but he's talking about this moment, each moment, which is again why he says, in the flesh. Right? So again, this isn't just a theological consideration, but how he lives his life. The life I am now living in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Gave himself for me. Paul is telling Peter that he's supposed to live every day by faith that Jesus gave himself for him. He's supposed to live out of his justification. Now, hopefully, at least in theory, this makes sense, right? I'm, I'm tempted because of the inward bent of my heart to look to people for my justification, to look to people to be right in some way. The belief being that if people declare me to be right through their approval or admiration or affection or acceptance or whatever it is, I will be right. I'll be okay. I'll be happy. So instead, I need to turn to the gospel, to trust in the justification of Christ having faith in the fact that God declares me righteous through the work of Jesus on the cross. But practically, how do we live out of the reality of the gospel or our justification? Because it's, it's, it's on, uh, let's be honest, it's great that God justifies us, but still it really hurts when a friend fails us. It feels horrible when people look down upon us. It feels so lonely when someone ignores us. What do we do in those moments because God's justification often seems so vague and intangible. I think importantly, we have to meditate on the better justification we find in Christ and guard against meditating on the justification we find in others. Now, that may seem equally vague and intangible. Like, so what do I mean by meditate? Meditate simply means to think deeply about something. Christian meditation is to think deeply about biblical truth. But what we have to realize, as I've shared before, is that the problem isn't that meditation is missing. It's just misdirected. In other words, we have to realize all of us meditate. All of us think deeply about things. And what this means is the danger isn't that we wouldn't meditate. The danger is that we would rather than meditate on biblical truth, we would meditate on something else. So in our particular focus, the danger is that I focus more on pe what people declare me to be rather than on what God declares me to be. What do you think about? Like when you're just driving, when you've had that conversation with a friend, what are you dwelling upon? Now we take this from Colossians 3, 2, when Paul says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are of earth. And then he goes on to say in verse 5, he says, put to death what is earthly in you. Things like evil desire, covetousness, anger, malice, and slander. In other words, if we set our mind on things of earth, we don't put to death what is earthly in us, we give it life. Do you see the picture? I mean, think about it. Our idols are dead. They're powerless. As Psalm 115, 5 and 6 say, they have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see, they have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. And as Christians, those are supposed to be dead to us. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. This is the power of the gospel. That, that former self with its only sinful bent is dead and with it should be our faith in the things of this world. And that's why later in Galatians, Paul will say, but far be it to me, but to boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The world is, is crucified to me. The world is meant to be dead to me. So where's the problem? If our idols are dead, if I have this new life, what's the problem? It's that we give our idols life. How? Through meditation. Again, think of Colossians. When we set our mind on things above, we put to death what is earthly in us. When we set our mind on things on earth, we give them life. So we meditate on what we want from others. We perform this spiritual CRP, uh, CPR that resurrects our idols. They're, they're like zombies, still dead, but animated and bent on destruction. And in giving them life, we also give them power. And I think this starts to make sense of our problem. The reason we're so easily we so easily convince ourselves that we need something from others is because of where we set our mind. We're giving life to our idols and they own us. 
So for example, as we scroll through Instagram and we see how amazing looking people are or supposedly are, it's easy to believe that we need to look a certain way, weigh a certain amount, dress a certain style to fit in, to be, lo- to be well-liked, to be justified. And really, it is an exercise in meditation. And then often people spend hours and hours thinking about what the world says is attractive. And so though it only matters what God declares us to be, through meditation, we give life to our idols and we give them the power to declare our worthiness based on our weight, our complexion, our height, or every other worldly metric. Or maybe you want to share your faith with someone. You want to invite them to church. But the minute you start to think about it, your mind races. And you play out all the different scenarios of how things will go poorly, how they'll judge you, how foolish you will look, how you'll stumble stumble to answer questions. And so though it only matters what God declares you to be, through meditation we give life to our idols and we give them the power to declare that our worthiness is based on what other people think of our beliefs. Or maybe it's about a significant other. And you think and you dream about what it would be like to have a romantic relationship And more than it would be nice, pretty soon, through meditation, you feel like you don't just want it, you need it. So again, though it only matters what God declares us to be, through meditation we give life to our idols, and we give them the power to declare of how we can only be happy in a romantic relationship. And without one, it says something about us, like our worthiness. Through it, we might even question the goodness of God because he seemingly withheld it. Or maybe it's some version of success. And so you fantasize about what people will think about you if you you get into that school or you hit the game-winning shot or you drive that car or you have that job title. And pretty soon through meditation, you convince yourself that your worth is tied to the admiration of others. And so though it only matters what God declares us to be, we give life to our idols and we give them the power to declare that our identity is tied to success. And with these in mind, doesn't it make sense of why we struggle to rest in the gospel? Like we just spend so much time thinking about and dwelling upon and really meditating on what we think we need from people. That, 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 we, we, that eventually we give life to idols and pretty soon we're convinced that if we're going to be right and happy, it comes from what we get from others. So how can we meditate on the truth of the gospel instead of our idolatry? I think it starts with just guarding against misdirected meditation that we just discussed. Like I know for me, one of the first things I have to do is just refuse to set my mind on things on earth and constantly be guarding against seeking my justification to others, feeling I need them to declare that I'm right or good. So for example, if I do feel that bent towards success or I'm worried about a tough conversation or I'm discouraged in preaching or I'm jealous over what people have, I have to remind myself that I'm seeking in others what I'm meant to find in Christ. That picture has to be clear to me. Otherwise, I won't even realize I'm doing it. Like we said, the the default setting in our hearts is to seek in others what we are meant to find in Christ, and we won't even know that we're doing it. But when this happens, we will hide our faith at work, for instance, and not even slow down and consider that that this is about wanting people's approval more than Christ. So for me, I'm, I'm literally reminding myself, Lord, I'm seeking my justification in others. And so we have to know what we're doing when we scroll through social media, when we try to be the best on the team, when we feel so insecure at school, when we want to fit in at work, when we hope our kids are more successful than their peers. We're searching for meaning and acceptance and approval. We want our lives to be right. And so we need to tell ourselves that what matters is not what people declare, but what God declares. And I think with this, we have to structure our lives to guard against, measure, to guard against meditating on the wrong things. Like, I think, I think we need to consider our social media intake. Like, it is permissible, but is it profitable? If it's not encouraging worship of Christ and conversely encouraging my idolatry, then I need to reevaluate and maybe even eliminate that for the sake of my soul. I need to consider my conversations with friends. Are there certain people that you talk to where it's probably not helpful? Are they encouraging your faith in Christ or fueling your idolatry? Like you might need to be just be more thoughtful with who you listen to and who gets to speak to your heart. You need to consider even your daydreaming, like when you, when you drive or when you work out or when you're by yourself. Is it as inconsequential as you think? Or is all that ruminating on potential successes or slights from others or potential what-ifs, is it encouraging your faith in people over Christ? I know for me, I'll often replay in my head some critique or I'll relive my failures. I'll dwell on what I think I needs to happen to be okay. Right? In my mind, I'll just start to go and start to race. 
And too often in this, I'm just forgetting Christ. And so I have to guard my heart against such meditation. So where has your meditation gone wrong? When is it most misdirected? Then, with the recognition that I'm tempted to set my mind on things on earth, I need to have truth ready to consider when I'm tempted to meditate on the wrong things and give life to my idols. I need truth ready to to set my mind on things above. Maybe it starts with this. When I'm tempted to meditate on, on what someone said about me and then worry about what it really says about me, I remind myself that I am who God declares me to be. Like no one else, ourselves included, has the ultimate authority to declare who we are. And God says we are righteous, forgiven, a child and an heir of our Heavenly Father. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what someone declares about me. I can rest in who God says I am. And shockingly, God, who knows everything about us, even the dark recesses of our hearts, says we are not just forgiven, but righteous in Christ. He says, you're my beloved. And for me, this comes out in simply reminding myself that that God gets to say who I am. I guess I'll literally pray like, God, I am who you say I am. And we need this. We need to shut out all the voices that try to declare who we are, that it's God's right. He gets to say this. Or when I'm tempted to want so badly for someone to like me or accept me or approve of me, I need to remind myself that God not only justifies me, but he adopts me and makes me his own. So though deserving nothing, he accepts me and approves of me through the work of Christ, even makes me his child. We have to slow down and take that in. The holy and righteous creator of the Uh, And Lord of the universe says we get to call him Father. As it describes in chapter 4, Christ came to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his sons into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. So as the world's approval and love is so often fickle, so often conditional, so often transactional, God knows everything about us and chooses to love us only out of the depths of his own goodness and for his own glory. I'm guessing for more than a few of you, it's so tiring feeling like you need someone to accept you and approve of you. And so so, so feeling feeling that need to, to, to do what it takes to earn, deserve, or even demand that. But we can rest in knowing that God looks at us and says, like, you're okay, like, you're righteous, you're my child. Or when I'm struggling with some mistake, some shortcoming, some failure, some inadequacy, we can remind ourselves that while we are sinful, finite human beings, and many of our inadequacies are very real, God declares us to be right through Christ. We are who God made us. I'm forgiven of all unrighteousness. My weaknesses are my strengths, and my failures are opportunities for God to be glorified in his power and kindness. I really believe that for many of you, your hearts would rest if you could live out of your justification. If you can embrace that you are who God says you to be. Right? There's just so much freedom and not having to live up to the world's standards of right and wrong, good and bad, significance and insignificance. You can just rest in who God says you are. Righteous in Christ, child of God, beloved by the Father. All right, second idea. Um, be there in your notes. It's we live by faith that Christ loves us. So knowing and embracing Christ's love really is transforming. Uh, we're going to come back to this next week. Again, I took a lot of time in the first point, so we won't spend as much time here. But for today, let's just briefly consider how Christ's love is just better than the other loves we seek. Now, uh, though a focus on justification would have been enough, it, it actually makes sense that Paul emphasizes God's love because one of the truths of the gospel it makes known is the love of Christ. Think of Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The idea being the gospel preaches God's love, and we're supposed to hear that and embrace that through faith. The love of God is meant to be one of the most transforming and comforting truths we believe in and the realities that we live in. What is important for us to realize is that the love of God is both unique and superior to every other love. In other words, it's not just love in general we need. We need Christ's love. Because our temptation is to substitute the love of Christ for more earthly loves. Right? I, I think most of us understand the longing to be loved We want someone to think we're meaningful, we're we're important, we have value, we're worthy in some way. 
And so we crave some version of love. But what we fail to realize is that so often our desire to be loved is because we so deeply and passionately love ourselves. And because we love ourselves, we desire significance and affection and affirmation, among other things. We long for those things that we believe will give our life meaning and that will make us happy, that will bring some measure of contentment. And in this love for ourselves, we'll pursue earthly loves that we feel will give us what we want. And similar to the previous point, we'll meditate on those things and we'll set our mind on the things of earth. So we'll think deeply about how we want our bosses to to commend us, our friends to like us, our spouse to admire us, our ministries to need us, our teammates to think well of us. We think and think and think about receiving some version of love. And after enough meditation, we give life to what is earthly in us. We resurrect our idols, we give them life and power. And when our wishes are rooted in misdirected worship, then our wants become needs and our desires become demands. And yet we have to remember that our idols are dead. They're false saviors. And so even if they bring moments of happiness or contentment, in the end, they will always fail us. We'll experience people's love that is transactional, right? Only willing to love us when we offer something. We'll experience people's love that is dangerous, actually moving us away from Christ. We'll experience people's love that is conditional, only willing to love when, they, when we are worthy. We'll experience people's love that is limited. Like regardless of how much people hope for us, they can only do so much as finite beings. In the end, idols will always reveal the reality that they are false savers, offering a damaged and at times dangerous love. And so practically, we have to meditate on the love of Christ so that we would understand that love and embrace that love. Remember, this is Paul's prayer for us in Ephesians 3. He prays that we would have the strength to comprehend with all the saints <clears throat> what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Right? When we know the love that surpasses knowledge, we'll be filled with the fullness of God. So what does it mean to meditate on Christ's love? It means that when we're tempted to feel like we need something from others, we instead have truth ready to remind us like Christ loves us. So, for example, like I mentioned in the previous point, his love is about relationship. Christ loved us, died for us, so we could be part of God's family. I hope you take that in. As I've always often said before, for me, Christianity can feel like a lot of things on a lot of days. Sometimes it's a bunch of things we have to do. Sometimes it feels like God is distant. Sometimes I feel alone. Sometimes I feel like a failure. But God looks at me and he sees his son. He is near and present. He is forgiving and loving. He is kind and merciful. Right? God knows you. He loves you. His love is the promise of faithfulness. As we've said, so often the love of people is fickle. There's an end to it. It's, it's, it's dependent on who we are, what we've done. But Christ's love is different. All right? So whereas people's love is dependent on our worthiness, Christ loves us despite our unworthiness. Where people's love is in exchange for what, we've done, what we offer, Christ's love means he exchanged his life for us so that we would know eternal life. People's love has its ceiling. Christ's love knows no end. Dan Orland put it this way in his book, Gentle and Lowly. He says, love does not love like us. Jesus does not love like us. We love until we're betrayed. Jesus continued to the cross despite betrayal. We love until we're forsaken. Jesus loved through forsakenness. We love up to a limit. Jesus loved to the end. And of course, God's love reminds us that he uses his power for our good. Even when people love us, their love is limited by their lack of power. They can't heal our sickness. They they rarely can take away our sufferings. They can't change our hearts. But the love of Christ is active and powerful, constantly pursuing our good. I know for me, the love of Christ is the truth I remind myself of the most. Like just going through the week, that's the one I think about the most. As we'll discuss next week, his love is meant to be the lens through which our world comes into focus. So where does this leave us? We find victory over our people pleasing by living by faith in the truths of the gospel. We live every moment, every day, out of the reality that Jesus loved us and died for us. And that brings us back to the question I asked at the beginning. What does it really mean to embrace the gospel for everyday life? It's what Paul describes in this verse. It means the gospel, in the gospel, Christ justifies us and he loves us. And so we have to live each moment out of those realities. So to embrace the gospel for everyday life means I live by faith that Jesus loved me and died for me. Now, next Sunday, we'll revisit some of these truths 
in particular, we'll celebrate, as we celebrate the gospel, we'll consider what it means that we actually all live by faith. The question is, what do we live by faith in? I think it'll be a good service to invite unbelieving friends and family to. Uh, if you're nervous about that, then you can re-listen to the last couple of messages and hopefully overcome that. As we close, can I give you a moment to reflect on what we studied? I think it'd be good to take a moment to repent of your misdirected worship, to consider the ways you're setting your mind on things of earth, how you're tempted to see people as a God that offers some version of salvation, but then take time to consider the gospel, what it means that Christ, that that God justifies you in Christ, that he declares you're right and that's who you are. Believe that if you, you live every day out of that reality, it will change everything. So let's take a moment and reflect on that and then I'll close our time in prayer. Tell him, Father, while we confess that, <clears throat> while we would tell people you are God, too often we see those same people as our God. We long for people to love us, we, to declare that we're right and good, and so forgive us of that idolatry. We pray, Lord, that you'll impress upon our hearts the truths of the gospel. Help us to know and believe that you are the one who gets to say who we are. And thank you, Lord, that in Christ you declare us to be righteous. And so give us the grace we need uh, to live every day, every moment out of the reality that Jesus loves us and he died for us. We thank you, Lord, for your kindness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to please rise and let's sing of the freedom we have from the fear of man and that uh, into the identity and hope that we have in Christ. Belong to Jesus.
Jesus, by His grace alone, I belong to Jesus, I am not my own, I belong to Jesus. Father, we thank you for the word that we heard this morning, and we ask that you would take the truth of your word, apply it to our hearts, warm our hearts with the gospel, which reminds us that we have been justified because of Christ, that we are loved by him, and remind us of that so that we might understand ourselves rightly and love others rightly. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You can go ahead and take a seat. Well, this morning we have the privilege of inducting new members to our Lighthouse Church family. And so if you're here, if you're one of those new members, I invite you to go ahead and uh, start to make your way onto stage behind me. Um, But becoming a member here at Lighthouse means that you are making a public and formal commitment to being a part of this local church family. And as a member, you are committing yourself to the other members here, uh, as well as to the leadership and the leaders and the rest of the church are also committing to you, to these new members, through care and accountability, uh, through the pastors and the elders leading and shepherding and protecting and caring for you as those for whom they are accountable. The membership process here at Lighthouse involves taking a six-week class and then meeting with one of the pastors for an interview. And today we are glad to welcome a total of 28 uh, new members. And in this service, we have 10 of them Uh, with us, and I know that these membership inductions can maybe feel like uh, graduation, you know, like we read their names, and we should have them walk across the stage and like (laughs) shake Pastor Kim's hand, but probably a more fitting analogy isn't really a graduation, but it's a wedding, and I know that sounds kind of weird, but at a wedding, uh, there are promises made, and even as a friend or a family member or a guest, you are also taking part, you're committing yourself Uh, to helping them fulfill what they've just promised. And so in a similar way, as we witness these new members make these promises and and they join this church family today, uh, for the rest of us, if you are a member here, may you also be reminded of the commitments that you made when you joined this church family. And may we be eager to commit ourselves to them, to, to come alongside them, to love and serve and play a part in their discipleship. And so... Uh, Let me read the names of the new members here with us. I'm going to move over here. And then uh, when I read your name, if you don't mind just waving so we kind of know who you are. And then after that, we're actually going to read the membership covenant together. And and we'll make the commitments together. Uh, And so first is Kerry Akiyama, Cecilia Aquino, Mina Bloom, Jessica Choi, Daniel Gima, Timothy Lau, Alicia Miller, Jordan Miller, Philip O'Connor, and then Lindsay Yoshiba. And so here are the commitments that the leadership is making to you as a new member. We, we commit to helping you grow in Christ-likeness through the teaching and modeling of God's word, to equipping you for the work of ministry and providing opportunities for you to use your gifts and share the gospel. Uh, we commit to providing biblical fellowship based upon the truths of loving God and loving others, providing spiritual guidance and counsel according to God's sufficient word, providing accountability, even discipline, so that you might stand firm and stay on the narrow path of righteousness, and helping provide for the physical provisions of those members in need. 
uh, for all of you as new members, this is what you're committing to, uh, the following before God as a member of this church. Do you commit to personal growth and holiness through regularly gathering with God's people here at Lighthouse, as well as through personal disciplines, to fellowship through being a part of other people's lives and allowing them to be a part of your life, to serving the church through the faithful stewardship of the unique gifts, resources, and opportunities that God has given you, to sharing the gospel with others, sacrificial giving as a means of worship and to provide for God's ministry, and submitting to the church leadership? If so, please say, I do. And then finally, if you're here and you are a member of Lighthouse, do you commit yourself to love, serve, pray for, encourage, and exhort these brothers and sisters that they might be faithful to Jesus Christ and his church here at Lighthouse? If so, please say, I do. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks for all of these new members who are joining our church today. We thank you for saving each of them, for calling them out of darkness and into your marvelous light for placing them here at Lighthouse. We pray that each of them would continue to grow in personal holiness and maturity in their own spiritual lives, that Christ would be formed in them, and that their lives would bear much fruit. We pray that you would give them the grace to be faithful to Jesus Christ, to fulfill the commitments that they are making as a member. Would you surround each of them with people who can know them, who can pray for them and encourage them to run the race that you've set before them. Provide opportunities for them to serve and contribute and bless. And use the ordinary means of grace, the weekly preaching of the word, prayer, fellowship, and accountability, the labor and shepherding of their leaders to remind them of the gospel and make them more like Christ. Grow a love and affection in all of us for the people of this church. That as 1 Corinthians 12 says, that none of us would ever say to another part of the body, I have no need of you. But rather, when, when, when one member suffers, all suffer together. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together. And so again, Father, we thank you for all of these new members. May they be a blessing to us and us to them. All that Christ would be exalted and proclaimed. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome them. Let's... You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Right, we have just a few announcements as we wrap up our service. Uh, we invite you to join us this Friday for our Good Friday services. We have uh, services at 5 p.m. and 7 p.m., and we will reflect on the death of our Savior Jesus Christ together. Uh, there will be a time of prayer, singing, and some devotionals. And Please invite your friends to join us for this. And then that Sunday, uh, we will be celebrating Easter, uh, Christ's resurrection from the dead, and uh, we'll have our normal uh, service times, so 9, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and 5 p.m., and we are expecting more people than usual uh, on that Sunday, and so uh, we ask you to uh, consider uh, joining us for the 5 p.m. service just so we can free up some spots, for, especially for those who are visiting. And so that's uh, next weekend, Good Friday and Easter. Um, the next announcement is about the Beacon and Praxis Retreat. So for all the collegians and young adults, just a reminder that today is the last day to sign up for this upcoming retreat. We do have just a limited number of spots available. Um, the retreat's April 12th to 14th at Pali. And so if that's your age group, um, please consider joining us. But today's the last day to sign up for that. And then lastly, uh, this is just a save the date announcement. But we're excited to do another Exiles Conference this summer. Um, this conference will be geared towards our young people, so junior high, high school, um, college students are welcome as well. Uh, and this conference will help equip them uh, to wisely and biblically navigate through some of the cultural and practical issues that they might be facing today. And so save the date for that, July 12th to 13th. All right, let me send you out with the benediction. This is from 1 Thessalonians 3. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week.